Good morning. Today is Monday, October the 8th, and this is The Drill. And thank you very much. This is uh, Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. So uh, Judge, uh, well, now Justice Kavanaugh. So he uh, got uh, Judge Kavanaugh got confirmed over the weekend on Saturday uh, sometime in the morning. And and, um, so uh, I'm sure there's a lot of Republicans and Republican politicians that are saying, well, all's well that ends well. And not true. Uh, there's some uh, some takeaways from this episode uh, that are important. Uh, the The whole situation in terms of being dragged out and being there being um, smears of uh, Judge Kavanaugh are the Republicans' fault. The Republicans in the Senate. It is their fault that this occurred. Uh, the number one rule of power is to exercise the power you already have. The the weakest thing you can do and worst thing you can do is refuse to exercise power you already have. My uh, grandmother had a a family member that was living in the house with her for uh, decades, and this family member was abusive uh, to her. And my grandmother owned the house, owned the property, could have had this individual evicted, could have had this individual prosecuted, and refused to do so until finally one day uh, she did get to the point where she just got sick and tired of it and, uh, you know, said that's, uh, that's, uh, and finally put her foot down. But for decades she refused to use, we'd, we'd tell her, we said, why don't you, you know, uh, evict this person? And um, so uh, she wouldn't do it. And so uh, you're there's she used to also have a saying uh, about people getting what they deserve. And, um, you know, she got what she deserved. My grandmother did because she refused to exercise the power she already had. So so does the Republicans, uh, Senator Grassley, Senator McConnell, uh, because they refused to exercise the power they had. They're in the majority. The Republicans are in the majority, whether uh uh, Diane Feinstein or Chuck Schumer likes it or not. Okay, it doesn't matter whether they like it. Okay, um, the the people have put uh, the Republicans in charge of the Senate. That's it. So use your power. Number one. Number two is uh, res- uh, no respect for reality from the Republicans. And let's be clear on this, that the Republicans are the party of reality. Republicans are the party of conservatives, and conservatism is, if uh, nothing else, about respecting and acknowledging reality. And one of the fundamentals of reality is that you cannot prove a negative. You cannot be in two places at the same time. You can't have your cake and eat it too, and you can't prove a negative. And yet, There were the Republicans uh, bending over backwards to try to prove a negative, prove to uh, the world that they're being fair about the uh, the confirmation process, bending over backwards to try to prove that they have nothing against women, that they're not against women. And the problem is that whenever you try to prove a negative, and it usually starts with an arbitrary allegation of some sort, that you end up proving the exact opposite. You end up looking guilty, like you have a guilty conscience, and you end up uh, giving people the impression that you are the very thing you're trying to prove that you are not. And not only, though, with the, the Republicans, are they smearing themselves as individuals and smearing the party, they're smearing all men. They are basically uh, saying that all men have something to be guilty about, to feel guilty about, and uh, that all men, given the opportunity, uh, would uh, um, molest a woman and uh, try to get away with it. And that's BS. But it's, again, the Republicans go ahead and make the, um, by trying to prove the negative, make it look that way. The left is constantly trying to create stereotypes where it comes to conservatives. 
And uh, one of the the stereotypes that they try to conser- uh, create is that uh, men are um, uh, serial and inherent molesters and rapists. Uh, the other one, of course, is that the that men, uh, white men, are and all white people, as a matter of fact, are inherently racist. So it's uh, they're trying to create stereotypes that way. And so the Republicans went ahead and played into that stereotype. Now, um, in part, well, I mean, I, I was going to say in part, uh, the reason that Kavanaugh ended up getting confirmed was because of the ineptness of the left, because the left um, you know, plays these games, the right plays along with them, and uh, you would figure that the left would uh, end up running uh, the entire country uh, because of it, but uh, yet they don't. And uh, so I was going to say that it was because of the ineptness of the left that they're not um, enjoying more power. Um, so uh, those are a couple of takeaways. Number one, use the power that you've got, which they didn't, and uh, acknowledge reality. And and what I was going to say, too, was that the ultimately what ended up happening is reality prevailed. Okay, all the pretending going on, um, the left pretending that uh, Judge Kavanaugh is a should be considered a rapist simply because he's a man, and the Republicans going along with it, and yet um, uh, reality ended up prevailing. People knew that uh, it was a scam that you that um, the liberals were trying to prove a negative or get their Republicans to prove a negative, and absent that proof. Um, sabotage the nomination of uh, Judge Kavanaugh, and it didn't work. So um, reality uh, reared its beautiful head and uh, thwarted the attempts by the left to um, subvert uh, the confirmation process. But it'll, it'll be back. This isn't the first time this has happened. The first time that I've seen it happen, uh, that has happened in my lifetime, was uh, with... Um, well, it's twice that it's happened, twice, two other times. Once it was absolutely successful and that the uh, nomination of the candidate was withdrawn, and that was with Judge Bork, and the other time uh, it was not successful and uh, Judge Thomas became Justice Thomas. But again, they did the same kinds of, pulled the same tactics and techniques on those two that they've pulled on Kavanaugh, and the next one that comes up for um, nomination by a, re- a Republican president, whether it's Donald Trump or anyone else, is uh, going to um, uh, face the same kinds of things. The other uh, the other takeaway on this, by the way, is the Republicans saw this coming. Every Republican I heard on the radio or television uh, was saying, it was bragging, oh, I know this is coming. I know this is going to be the, the biggest deal since the Civil War, but they did nothing about it. They did nothing to try to, as a prophylactic measure, to try to guard against this, to try to minimize the effects that the um, left's uh, subterfuge would have on uh, this confirmation process. So uh, very disappointing on the part of the Republicans. They have to do better, and they have to start with philosophy, with metaphysics, uh, epistemology, ethics, etc. Bone up on it. And all these folks, by the way, in Congress are lawyers. And uh, in law school, one of the, the they have to take philosoph- philosophy courses. They have to be versed in metaphysics, in epistemology, in ethics, etc. Because um, all of that has to do with their jobs. One of the fundamental jobs of uh, politicians and lawyers is debate. And there's certain rules of debate. And the first rule of debate is that the presumption is always made for the status quo. So, okay, uh, today I'm going to be um, uh, dealing with uh, Rush Limbaugh. His, um, he uh, kind of s- uh, slipped up again, made a mistake uh, in, about a um, faux conservative called uh, Jennifer uh, Ruben, so I'll be dealing with that, and then go moving on to Ayn Rand and her lexicon, and then uh, 
end up with um, the 10 books that uh, screwed up America when we come back. Thank you very much. Welcome back. And I can always count on the Erzots, uh conservatives to be um, a good negative examples. Uh, and in this particular case is Rush Limbaugh and uh, from his show and from the uh, app from his show, uh, they, the Rush Limbaugh show. And the title of this particular transcript is called Faux Conservative Jennifer Rubin, GOP Senators Acting Like It's Their Time of the Month. Rush, drama on the Senate floor today, drama that not even Hollywood could have created. Something very unusual happened on the Senate floor today. Every senator was there. Usually on these votes, they vote electronically, come in, out, vote, leave. They were all there. It looked like half the place was empty when the vote started, but then the Democrats began to file in. Happy to have you here, folks. 800-282-2882 if you want to be with us today. The email address is lrushbo at eibnet.com. US. Let me share with you a little story here. It's about something that happened on PMS NBC today. And l- uh, let me interrupt uh, real quick here uh, because uh, he has these little quirky um, things that he says, a uh, scroll and whatnot. And this is one of them, PMS NBC. And again, I, uh, he should knock it off with this stuff. You want to do it once, that's fine. That's funny or it's interesting or whatever, but over and over and over again, and uh, it's ridiculous. It's CNBC, not PMSNBC. Okay, back to the uh, transcript. And uh, uh, let's see, what did I, did I just put it at the bottom of the stack? It's about something I really uh, comment on because I don't care. This phony faux conservative, her name is Jennifer Rubin. Yeah, here it is, Jennifer Rubin. It's amazing the transformation this woman has made. The Washington Post hired her as a conservative blogger during the Obama years. During the Obama years, for the most part, she came across as a conservative blogger. Then when Trump gets elected, she became, I think, what she's always been, just a dyed, cast-in-the-wool liberal. Now she's still the conservative column blogger at the Post, but she's not really conservative, and MSNBC refers to her that way. But that's not the point. I couldn't tell you the story without mentioning her name. She says the GOP senators are behaving as if it's their time of the month. Now that, to me, goes a little deeper than what it just sounds like here on the surface. Imagine a conservative saying on MSNBC that a female Democrat senator was being so emotional, almost hysterical, behaving as if it's their time of the month. Does anybody think that would fly? There's no way a male commentator anywhere could say that about women senators or women witnesses or anything of that sort. Uh, Okay, and then a little bit farther down, let's see. Let's see. uh, uh, Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, Let's see what else. Here is the premise of the minute. Hmm, that's not what I'm looking for. That there is such a phenomenon that cursed a woman, and then she. Nope, that's not it. Let's see. Oh, here we go. But here, Miss Rubin gets to talk about it um, uh, as though it's common and every day and everybody gets it. Everybody understands it. Everybody knows what it means. It means stay away. Leave it alone. Don't engage. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Three bags full, whatever. And she goes on. She's admitting this. So, uh, again, with uh, that I've mentioned before with Rush Limbaugh, and he continues to, to make this mistake, is that he makes it sound as though he's jealous. Uh, here, this woman went out and said the senators are acting like it's their time of the month. And then he, uh, Rush Limbaugh comes back and says, wow, what if I did that? What if uh, other conservatives, what if our Republicans did that? You know, and then he says here, she gets to do this. And what he should be saying, and this is, again, where both the parties end up looking similar. They look exactly alike. Okay, and in part, uh, it's the Republicans' fault because they don't make the distinctions. They don't stop and say what they should say, which is no Republican in his right mind would ever say such a thing. This particular comment was 
uh, odious, hideous. It was wrong. It was stupid. That would be an excellent way to put it, actually, that what she is saying is stupid. No Republican on the face of the earth would be caught dead saying such a thing. No conservative would even think about such a thing. Only the Democrats, only the socialists come up with this kind of crap. Okay, And the reason you should say that is because, again, you got people out there that are listening. Some of them might be, um, uh, you know, people have voted for a long time, but independents refuse to state and perhaps most impo- importantly, young uh, people, 17, 18 years old, that are just beginning to uh, get into politics and are starting to think about, do I want to participate in political life? And if so, to what degree? And uh, should I be a party member? I, I brought this up um, a few days ago about here in California. There's a surge in voter registration. The vast majority of these new uh, registrants refuse to state a political party or preference. Refuse to state. Uh, 50 years ago, it was unheard of. Refuse to state or independent. What, what was that? You were either a Republican or you were a Democrat. That's all there is to it. But part of the reason that I, I'm guessing that a lot of folks are not picking a party is because both of them look the same. And the, part of the reason they do that, they look the same, is because Republicans refuse, when they have the opportunity to make the distinction between Republicans and Democrats, refuse to do so. Here's again, Rush Limbaugh, uh, Erzatz, Republican, Erzatz, conservative, and he could have and should have said, no Republican in his right mind, make a value statement. Instead of going to the listeners and saying, gee, I'm jealous. How come I can't say the crap that Miss Rubin can say? And sounding petulant and uh, as though he's really no better than the, at heart, really no better than the Democrats, the liberals that he uh, criticizes every day. So uh, that's what he should have done and what he should do in the future. Okay, when we come back, I'm going to be reading from um, the 10 books that screwed up the world. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, actually, not the 10 books that screwed up the world. I'm going to be reading from... uh, the Playboy interview of Bill O'Reilly. I haven't read this one for a while, but I was looking at it, and it's got uh, some interesting stuff in there I want to comment on. Playboy, among your environmental views, you've taken special glee in attacking... Okay, let's go back it up for a second. Um, in the interview, they were going over basically his bio, how he got into the business, uh, where he worked first and second, how he ended up at, at Fox. Now they're starting to get into his political views. Um, let me see. Uh, Playboy, how important was the network's Fox uh, conservative slant? O'Reilly, not at all. As I've said, my most loyal viewers are all over the place, and so are my views. Playboy, let's look at some. You have said the federal government has to be tougher when it comes to the environment. With that position, you depart from most conservatives. O'Reilly, that's right. There should be a strong EPA. I would make it much stronger. I would levy fines more dramatically on polluters. I would demand that Detroit make cars that get 40 miles to the gallon. Playboy, among your environmental views, you've taken specially in attacking sports utility vehicles and have said that women who drive SUVs are specially crazed. Especially crazed. Why? O'Reilly, power. They get behind that wheel and watch out. I pull over when I see them, especially if they're little women with big hair. I'm off the road. The point about SUVs is that they are a symptom of our selfish society, but we need to conserve. Um, Let me see. Uh, Now they're going to about to go on to something else, but I want to take this and say he's got an idea that is part of pragmatism. Pragmatism says that uh, why should you have to be held to one particular political uh, or philosophical or any type of ideological viewpoint? 
why not? Why is it that you can't just simply switch your political views whenever it's convenient for you and whenever you think it's going to make you uh, uh, sound good, whenever you think it's going to give you the most power? And it's crap. You can't do it because it's a matter of identity. You can't be all things to all people at all times. You are who you are. If you're conservative, that means that uh, you make the presumption for the status quo, period. Uh, If you uh, are capitalistic in nature, then you're going to make the uh, presumption for um, you're going to uh, you're going to support property rights. And uh, capitalism and conservatism basically go hand in hand. But anyhow is, uh, well, let's put it this way. I'm I'm kind of over uh, getting a little bit uh, ahead of myself. Conservatism is not uh, generally defined the way I define it, which is a person that makes the presumption for the status quo and changes uh, when uh, only when change is absolutely necessary. Uh, That it's basically that the idea of conservatism is that conservatism is an idealistic movement, that it is as much in search of an ideal society as is socialism, uh, but that conservatives just simply have a different idea of what's ideal uh, as uh, compared to uh, the socialists, compared to the liberals, compared to the left in this country. So, uh, and they, furthermore, that it depends on where you stand on issues such as the environment as to where whether or not you're conservative or liberal. So the liberals take the position of being pro EPA uh, that be, and they do so because for two reasons. Number one is skepticism, and number two uh, is the um, is being anti property. Okay, environmentalism is based on the idea that, first of all, that nothing can be known with certainty. And secondly, on the idea that everything belongs to everybody. They started with the air. They say, well, you know, our, the air we breathe. Okay, as though the air belongs to everyone in common. Uh, The ground, uh, you know, that uh, pollution of the earth, pollution of the waters, etc., etc. As though all of those things are held in common. They are not, uh, unless they happen to be public property. It, but it basically still goes down to public and private property. If a river runs through my property, that part of the river belongs to me as my property. Um, uh, I can't. I don't know that I can dam it up, but I can use it as I pretty much as a, as I see fit. Uh, the air and the mineral rights is the other direction. Actually, I was trying to go here. You buy a house, and generally speaking, unless uh, you get rooked. You own the mineral rights, which means that I own the rights uh, not just at the surface where the house is uh, placed. I own the the property that goes all the way down to the center of the earth. Okay, That meaning, and the, the reason that's important, if you don't own the mineral rights, somebody else owns them, they can sell them, say, to an oil company. And you can have a house, and then one day an oil company decides to set up an, an oil derrick in your backyard and start drilling for oil because they own the mineral rights. You own the house, but since they own the mineral rights, they get to set up an oil derrick and drill for oil uh, on your property. So that's why it's, it's important that you own the mineral rights to, uh, uh, to your property. And again, that means all the way down to the center of the earth. Okay. Now you also own which is not discussed very often, the airspace. Okay, you you own what you what you own is three dimensional. Let's put it that way. So uh, you own the house, you own the the property, the land that the house sits on, but you also own uh, the property, uh, the the land that the house sits on, all the way down to the center of the earth, and you own the airspace, infinity, all the way into space and beyond. Okay, so uh, technically what that means is uh, if an airplane goes through your airspace, you could uh, you could um, decide that the airlines are going to have to pay to drive uh, to fly through your airspace. It doesn't happen, but um, the reality is that's the way it works, that you own the airspace above the house. 
So this idea that we all own the air in common is BS. We don't. In, in public property, if you're at a park, a city park or something, yes. But uh, when you're at your house on your property um, or some other piece of privately owned property, it belongs to the property holder. And that's what's wrong with the EPA. The theory is that uh, for the left is that if everything is held in common, then we need a governmental agency to regulate uh, land, regulate air and uh, water, et cetera. And it's just, and it's just flat out BS. It's based on uh, errors. Uh, it's counterfactual as a basis. It's also, as I've said, it is about skepticism. And skepticism is uh, environmentalist, the environmentalist's best friend. Uh, skepticism uh, positing the contradiction that nothing can be known with certainty. This is where we got the endangered species list. The whole idea of endangered species is based on superstition. Okay, this is in law now. We have laws that say it is more important to be superstitious than it is to be intellectual, to be smart, to be a thinker. Okay, because uh, the theory of of the um, endangered species is if we allow a species to go extinct, or let's put it this way, that we cannot allow a species to go extinct because we don't know what will happen to the rest of the food chain and how that's ultimately going to affect human beings. Now, if you don't know how something is going to affect you, you don't generally make policy on that basis. If it's important that you know how it's going to affect you, you go out and seek the knowledge. You go out and uh, conduct st- tests and studies to find out how things are going to affect you. Once you acquire that knowledge, then and only then can you and should you make a decision uh, in terms of personal or public policy about that situation. But we don't do that here. Uh, in the, the EPA has the says, no, 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 you can't kill certain species. Uh, you can't, and, it's, and not only can you not kill them directly, you can't fish or hunt for them uh, or treat them as pests in, in a lot of cases, but also you have to respect their habitat. So you can't build uh, housing on certain pieces of land. You can't uh, develop, you know, develop certain pieces of property, wetlands, and on and on. Why? Because we don't know what's going to happen. Well, it's ridiculous. Again, then you're back into the prove a negative mode. Mode prove that nothing terrible is going to happen if you put you put your house on a piece of property that has uh, an endangered species like the snail darter. And it's impossible to do. It's a power move, a power grab. And it is absolutely socialistic because it paves the way for getting rid of private property. <clears throat> so uh, when um, Mr. O'Reilly comes out and says, oh, yes, I'm pro EPA, he's declaring himself to be a socialist. But on the other hand, he claims to be a conservative and promotes conservative issues abortion, etc. These kinds of people, by the way, a lot of others uh, folks want to call them moderates. Somebody might call Bill O'Reilly a moderate. Why? Because he's a uh, left on the environment, but he's on the right on every other issue. No, that's wrong. There's something that Aristotle identified 2,000 years ago. It's called the law of the excluded middle with regards to identification. Okay, He came up with what is A is A, which is the law of identity. What is A cannot be non-A, which is the law of non-contradiction. And the third law that applies here, um, everything is either A or non-A. That's called the law of the excluded middle. So you're going to hear a lot of people in the left say, what about the middle ground? What about we got to find middle ground. No, we don't, because there is no such thing. It doesn't exist. Okay? And there's no moderate either, politically. Now, Bill Riley, you say, well, here's Bill Riley. He claims to be left over here, but right on these other issues. What is he? 
confused. Absolutely 100% confused. And again, he has succumbed to pragmatism. And the pragmatics are the ones that says, hey, why not just pick and choose? Be eclectic about your philosophical and political beliefs. A little bit of socialism, maybe a little bit of Nazism, maybe uh, a little bit of conservatism, and just kind of put it together and have your own personal blend. No, sorry, it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> it's not only, it's, and it's bad because it ruins your reputation. Bill O'Reilly has less influence with people, particularly conservatives, well, anybody, because nobody on the left is going to trust him. Okay, so he moves a little bit left on the environment, but they're not going to trust him. They're not going to listen to him and pay attention to what it is that he has to say. People on the right aren't going to pay very much attention to what he has to say either. He's going to be treated strictly as an entertainer, a clown. Okay, that's basically it. Because let's assume for the sake of argument that the meaning of life is influence, is being able to influence other people's decisions. The way you're going to be able to do that, to influence as many people as possible, is through credibility. Okay? You have to have maximum amount of credibility for maximum amount of influence. In order to have maximum credibility, you must have maximum amount of integrity. And integrity is basically consistency. Okay? The more you contradict yourself... The more the the less integrity you're displaying, the less credibility you have, the less people are likely to listen to you. <clears throat> Even small things like Rush Limbaugh's in the habit of opening a show with a rock and roll tune. I, I don't know the name of it, but it's by the Pretenders. The lead singer of the Pretenders is a woman who hates the United States. That's right. She hates the United States. Uh, she routinely, if she goes into a studio somewhere and there's a, an American flag hanging somewhere, she demands that it be taken down. That kind of thing. And yet, he is putting one of her tunes as a uh, as the um, theme song for his show. And he routinely plays rock and roll as bumper music, even though rock and roll is uh, countercultural. So is jazz and blues, for that matter. Sean Hannity's better at it because he plays uh, country music uh, for his uh, lead-in, and a lot of his bumper uh, music is, uh, cunt is uh, country. But, again, that comes back to pragmatism, where Rush Limbaugh gets to say, well, why not? Why can't I go in um, you know, and, and be eclectic about it, pick a little of this, a little of that? Or Rush might be saying, well, hey, this is a delicious irony and an extra way to stick my thumb in the eyes of the socialists. They want to claim rock and roll as their own. I'm going to go ahead and take rock, put it in as my theme song, and say, yeah, 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 there's nothing you can do about it. And I guess attempt to hijack rock and roll and make it a, a conservative uh, form of entertainment although it's not going to happen. All it ends up doing is hurting Russia's credibility. A little bit, but again, you, a little bit here, a little bit there, and uh, pretty soon uh, nobody's really paying attention to you. They're tuning into your broadcast uh, merely uh, to laugh at you. Again, you end up making a clown out of yourself. Okay, when we come back, uh, Ayn Rand and the Ayn Rand Lexicon. All right, thank you very much. So, let's see. Um, there's a couple of uh, entries here that I want to skip. One is called, oh, I already did the choreographer, but Christmas. Um, I, and, and whether or not it's appropriate for an atheist to celebrate Christmas, I don't care. Um, so, I'm going to move on to civil disobedience. Civil disobedience may be justifiable in some cases when and if an individual disobeys a law in order to bring an issue to court. Uh, as a test case, such an action involves respect for legality and a protest directed only at a particular law, which the individual seeks an opportunity to prove to be unjust. The same is true of a group of individuals 
when and if the risks involved are their own. But there is no justification in a civilized society for the kind of mass civil disobedience that involves the violation of the rights of others, regardless of whether the demonstrator's goal is good or evil. The end does not justify the means. Thank you. No one's rights can be secured by the violation of the rights of others. Mass disobedience is an assault on the concept of rights. It is a mob's defiance of legality as such. The forcible occupation of another man's property or the obstruction of a public thoroughfare is so blatant a violation of rights that an attempt to justify it becomes an abrogation of morality. An individual has no right to do a sit-in in the home or office of a person he disagrees with, and he does not acquire such a right by joining a gang. Rights are not a matter of numbers, and there can be no such thing in law or in morality as actions forbidden to an individual, but permitted to a mob. The only power of a mob as against an individual is greater muscular strength, i.e. plain brute physical force. The attempt to solve social problems by means of physical force is what a civilized society is established to prevent. The advocates of mass civil disobedience admit that their main purpose is intimidation. A society that tolerates intimidation as a means of settling disputes, the physical intimidation of some men or groups by others, loses its moral right to exist as a social system, and its collapse does not take long to follow. Politically, mass civil disobedience is appropriate only as a prelude to civil war, as the declaration of a total break with the country's political institutions. And most of the, you know, a couple of things on there that she uh, misses that the, uh, most civil disobedience is the left's attempt, because you'll notice that mass civil disobedience, by and large, is a tool of the left. And it is their way of trying to instigate a uh, civil war slash revolution so they can usher in socialist paradise. It's their way of agitating. They don't care about the cause. Find any cause, doesn't matter what it is, as an, and use it as an excuse to go ahead and do uh, mass disobedience. Uh, and then the other thing where I would um, falter here about losing it, the society's moral right to exist as a social system and its collapse does not take long to follow. Another prediction, and predictions by and large are bad ideas because you're merely, you're substituting uh, basically a gambling when you're making a prediction, um, especially about um, metaphysical realities, but in a lot of cases about man-made realities as well. Or, I mean, especially about man-made realities. Metaphysical realities are a little bit more predictable. The motion of the sun and the stars and all that kind of thing. So, uh, what she should have done was say, um, it loses its moral right to exist as a social system, and its collapse should not take long to follow. Because, again, predictions are often used as an anti-concept is a way of obliterating, uh, obliterating a concept or idea, in this particular case, of trying to obliterate value statements. So uh, the way to counter that is make as many value statements as you possibly can. So, um, and uh, anyways, uh, let me see. Hold on a second. No, I'm going to go ahead and wait until uh, next time for the uh, 10 books that screwed up the world. So on that note, uh, we conclude another episode of The Drill. I thank you very much for listening, and until next time, have a great day.